Yeah, I can tell that most of you are from Sweden, right? Anyone outside of Sweden? Yeah? Where are you from? Come in. No? Where are you from? Well, Netherlands. Netherlands, Amsterdam, yeah? Uh, Finland, Helsinki. Finland, so you know Fruit as well? Yes, definitely. Good. And any more? Yeah? Hi. From Spain, good. We're not in Spain yet, but it's just a matter of time. In Sweden, uh, we are the market leader in uh, smoothies, as I'm sure you know. Swedish people, they don't drink enough smoothies, but we're still the market leader here, so we are proud to say that. Push is a Swedish company. Our biggest uh, department is in Stockholm. I think they just hired a couple new salespeople, so they might be around 17 people now. And we are also present in Finland. The office is growing a lot there. I think there are about eight people now. We are in Norway, there are seven people. We are in the Baltics, we just have distribution there. We're in Iceland, we just opened in Japan, and in Korea in a couple of months. And then we have our headquarters in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And that's where I am. I'm not on the Danish side, but I'm in the, the, inter on the international central team. And we are in Denmark. Um, 50% of all the fruit that we use in our smoothies, uh, the ones that you're drinking right now, are from developing countries. And that's a rule that we're not going to change. What you can see here, I can see that most of you are drinking this one. I'd say it's about 96% is from developing countries. And this one, pineapple, banana and coconut, is 99.9%. .9%. The reason why I don't say 100% is because our supplies do have the possibility to change from what farm they buy from from time to time so I can't say for sure but at least it's 99 percent. So by knowing that that at least 50 percent and most of our products 99 percent are from developing countries we do have a specific uh, relationship and in my mind responsibility to the source of origin to the developing countries. Uh, we need to know what's going on at the fruit farms, so where we buy our fruit from. We need to know uh, what impact the farms are doing on the, on the local communities, and we need to know if they're doing a good or a bad thing. We're in 2015, we can't just close our eyes anymore. We need to know what's going on. And that's why we started this fruit farm program, that I will come back to you in a little bit. Um, First, we're gonna go and take this one. And I know that a couple of you went to went to a presentation I did about uh, six months ago, a year ago, yeah, something yeah. like that. Yeah. So you can't say anything because I use the same picture now. <laughs> Everybody else, these guys up here, really, really bad resolution for the pictures, but you know them. We're gonna go back to that guy uh, because he's the most interesting and relevant. And then this guy is that. Huh? She's wearing a cat, but you know her because she's in all the posters mm -hmm. and magazines and tabloids. Yes, indeed. And then we have Mr. Santa Claus is up there. Is that Bono? Bono. Yes, the icon Bono. And then we have this guy who, every time I ask who's that guy, young people like you. Like, yeah, I'm not really sure, but maybe you know now, because something happened just two months ago. This guy did a new little react. Did you see something? No, it's Bob Geldo. It is Bob Geldo. Who is he? Um, he was in band called like in Definitely, and what? But what did he just? What did he just do two months ago? You guys know? I think he's one of the band. Band-Aid, yeah. exactly. 30 years ago, first time, um, when the media first started to communicate the histories of hunger in Ethiopia, for instance, uh, Bob Geldo made out of a really, really generous and uh, nice DNA. He wanted to do something good for mankind. So what he did was that he 
collected all the most famous pop singers in the world, and then he made this fundraising CD. It was called CDs back then. Discs. You don't know about this. <laughs> Ask your parents. They will know. Band Aid was one of the biggest fundraising uh, stunts, media stunts, ever done at this time. And uh, they collected a lot of money, and it was sent some of it to Ethiopia. And that was all good. That was like the first uh, Let's Go Out and Save the World initiative done on a big scale. Gelba, now that I said this, does anyone know what I'm going to say now? Two months ago? No. Two months ago, he, he relaunched this. He did another band-aid. But this time it was for the Ebola victims in Nigeria, Togo, Ebola, right? <coughs> okay, so anyways, he did another um, launch of let's go out and unite and let's collect a lot of big famous singers and let's hold on each other's shoulders and let's sing this one particular song. And I should have played it for you now that you don't know it. I was sure that everybody would know it. It's called, Do They Know It's Christmas? And now some people are shaking. It's like, do they know it's Christmas? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a pop song. And uh, they did this song 30 years ago, and it was a big hit. It went on, on the British hit list number one, and it did the same thing again this year. Why am I talking about this? Um, this particular slide. I have as the first slide because this is not what we want to do. We don't want big famous people or ourselves to go out to Africa and stick our hands out and then get some big media to take a picture of us and say, wow, look what they're doing. Because honestly, I don't think they're doing anything. I think the only thing that they're promoting right now is themselves. Angelina Jolie doesn't even want to get out of the car. That's all she's doing. But this has become uh, a thing that big, famous pop stars and musicians and actors, they have to do. They have to do more than just do. They have to do something good. So let's go to Africa and get a picture taken. And let's go back and say that we saved someone. Bob Geldof, definitely good intentions. He wants to do something good, but he hasn't learned in the last 30 years. He hasn't learned that just getting a lot of pop stars, first of all, to, to sing Do They Know It's Christmas to Africans, where 70% are Muslims. They don't care about Christmas. The last 30%, of course, they know it's Christmas. They're Christians. I mean, why wouldn't they know it's Christmas? We're in 2015. He's using the exact same rhetoric as he did 30 years ago. Great intentions, I'm sure. Big heart, I'm sure. It's just not good enough. What is good enough is that a lot of... Musicians this time decided to say, we don't want to do this. We don't want to be a part of that. We would like to do something good. We would like to, to definitely be a part of a fundraising issue for, for Ebola victims. Of course, who can be against that? But we don't want to use that rhetoric, and we don't want to do it in this uh, large-scale focus as uh, Gilda, as his only way of uh, promoting things. And uh, we're happy that some people actually were courageous enough to say no. This created a lot of the uh, revolution in the media, but uh, maybe maybe not here. Uh, but you should uh, you should Google it later. I think it's uh, it's really relevant to where we are now. How we see Africa? Do we still see them as do they know it's Christmas? Poor guys, or not? So a really poor slide, but. The point is here, you see a big cross, and those of you who are studying economics, anyone? Lots, good. Uh, would know that if I say that this is the, the aid donated to Africa, more than 50 billion the last 50 years, and the growth in Africa, uh, and the reverse relationship, then you would know, even those of you who do not study economics, that it shouldn't be this way. It shouldn't be that we can continue to pour in aid money in a continent where you don't see the actual development. Actually, the GPD per capita in Africa right now is 50% is still living under the UN's 
pretty artificial, but still UN's poverty line. That's a dollar and twenty-five a day. So imagine how much money that your governments are pouring to various African governments. But the GPD is still worse than it was in the 70s. Something is wrong, and we think it's time to look at it. Where's all the money gone now? All this money that we poured in. Well, we would say that most of it are stolen, actually. Uh, stolen by prime ministers, people in government, who uh, put them in Swiss bank accounts. Was it in Switzerland? No. Anyway. Uh, and definitely not been used on the ground. They've been used to making big palaces and uh, flying around the world, but not to do, not to actually build their own country. Wasted. This little picture is uh, the president's. Uh, I think it's called Summer Cottage in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, have anyone been? No. Congo is a. Uh, one of the world's poorest countries, and it's not uh, very safe, and it's a rather grim daily life for most of the people in uh, in Congo. They uh, houses like we know it's not what uh, what is what you see most of, and you just you drive in gravel roads, you don't see anything, then suddenly you see that you see a big palace. No one is really living in there, but they were spent. That's your money that was spent to have some prime minister build his uh, muscles and show the rest of his neighbors that he can do this because he has the resources to do it. You see these absurd monuments all over the continent, unfortunately. And that's not just giving us, but also the people that are living next to it a really weird taste in your mouth to know that you're actually um, you don't even have a, a roof over your head, but the palace is, is right there. And then, Africa is absolutely awash with AK-47s everywhere you go. Of course, depending, some some parts are, are more fortunate than others, but you can pretty much always get automatic rifles. Why is it so plausible that a group of 13-year-old, 14-year-old boys suddenly try to take over the parliament, try to storm the buildings. To us, in Gothenburg, in Copenhagen, in Amsterdam, it sounds absurd. Like, who would do that? Like, of course they can't. They can. They actually can collect the weapons to go ahead and do uh, a coup, a coup d'etat at the parliament. It's only going to hurt themselves, <coughs> definitely, but it can happen because weapons are unfortunately available. And what's the best group of people to recruit to your little private army. That's of course young young guys. I've seen child soldiers down to the age of seven years old with guns in their hands. That's also our money. This is just a little cartoon here. He's saying it's wonderful. It's the G eight. You know the G eight, right? Which is the biggest countries most powerful in the world. Forgives our nation's debt, I won't have to return the money in my Swiss bank account. Debt forgiveness. You hear about that, right? Politicians, media, they talk about that. We should just, you know, forgive the developing countries all the debt because they can never pay it off. That's right. We need to do something. But we shouldn't just forget about it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just put a big cross over it because who is that going to help? The people in charge, the people who has the money already, it's not going to help that little guy. He's never going to see it anyways. It's an easy way to tell the public that now we're doing something good if the politicians are saying, let's just forgive the debt to the developing countries. But it's just uh, it's not doing the right people the right thing. So what we want to do now I'll talk a little bit about all the, all the dirtiness and all the not so nice scratches that we have here in our world. But the, the things that we do like to talk about here is the Africa that you won't see in the news. It's not the, the poor little guy who's trying to get into it. It's actually all the very, very well-educated, motivated, driven people who might most likely have been educated at 
Oxford or Harvard or somewhere. They get a scholarship somewhere. They go out, they educate themselves, and then they come back to to their even maybe even their village, but at least the capital in their in their home country. And they want to help. They want to continue to make the country better. You see so many very very talented people in particular in Africa. I'm I'm uh, completely uh, impressed and astonished that uh, that why would we ever in Sweden and Denmark, why would we ever tell anyone how they should do their job? Because we have a tendency to do that. We always know better. We like to say we need to do this and that. That's not how it works. These people are really, really smart and they can think for themselves and they know their country in a way that we don't know. We don't let anyone else come and tell us how to live. So why should we do it to anyone else? So this is the stories that we would like to promote because that's what we see when we go and visit fruit farms. And I'll come back to that. Just now, I can see, going back to that. This is our food care program. That's why I'm here today, really, because today you'll see um, an example of a CSR initiative, of a sustainable initiative. It's a buzzword, but people like it, so I use it. Um, and uh, and that's our food care program. It started about two year, three years ago when my boss, our CEO, Brendan, he unfortunately couldn't make it today, but he used to be the president of Coca-Cola in Africa. He was there for about seven years. And uh, he saw and felt on the ground how entrepreneurial and motivated and driven most African workers actually are. It's a different perspective than, than the, the one that we get in the, in the media. And he said, OK, so we have a specific relationship with fruit, obviously. As I said before, at least 50% comes from developing countries. We should get to know the conditions of this fruit. And I've seen that private businesses in Africa, in developing countries, are a force of good. It's a good thing. It's actually making a livelihood for people here. It's creating jobs, it's creating schools, creating health plans. Let's go out and see this. So. Three years ago, they started to send out people to India. It was the first trip, and you know it was it was kind of a loose, loose thing. We just sent out seven people from I think it was a few from a, from Presbyterian actually, and there's seven eleven from Denmark, and then a couple of fruit staff that we that we sent to this farm, and uh, it was a bit disorganized, and we come back, and and uh, people were very uh, very impressed by the farm, but also we were like we, we needed to know we needed to put some structure on them. On the thing. So uh, I started about two years ago, I think, and uh, and then we made um, a commitment saying that we want to visit all the main suppliers of our fruit. But we don't just want to do that. We want to visit as many fruit farms in the developing world because what we can see is that the fruit farms are making a difference. The suppliers that we have, we want to see the conditions that they're working under. We want to see the impact that they're doing. We want to see the schools that they're building. We want to meet the workers and talk to them and listen to their stories. And uh, this has meant that we are, what, 48 people in Prusch, 43, I don't know, something around there. And we have, 38 people have been on the trip by now, the last two years. It's a commitment from our side that everybody who starts working at Fruch, within the first year, you have to go on a trip. Because you need to not just be the expert of, of, a, of what fruit is in the bottles, but you need to be an expert of what fruit farms are doing to, to help the local community. <coughs> so the program for these, these trips is that we send out staff and customers, and media, photographers, and ambassadors as well. And then for one week, they wake up very early, and they go out and they dig holes, and they harvest, and they process, and they do all the different processes of fruit production. And uh, then they have lunch, then they go in the afternoon, they go and visit the school, they go and visit the health clinics, maybe they go talk to a politician, they go talk to the local workers, they might be invited to a, a coffee ceremony that takes three hours just to make the coffee because it takes so long to to actually grind the beans. And they get as much information and understanding about life on a fruit farm as possible. So when they come back, 
they are not just experts in, in the actual fruit, but they're experts in what is it, what does it mean that we're trading with developing countries? What does that mean to the local farmer? How is that helping him? And definitely, one thing that I found is that it doesn't matter where we send people. I've been to Malawi nine times by now, so we have a specific relationship with Malawi natives. I'll tell you about that in a little bit. We've also been to Peru. I came back from Guatemala four days ago. And been to Ethiopia, India, Thailand, um, Costa Rica, going to Ecuador, and that's where where's the little flyer? You got a little postcard, right? Yeah, yeah going to Ecuador in I don't know, a couple months. And uh, the point is, all fruit farms are doing, of course, their own unique setup. There's not a one size fit them all in order, in order to how to, to strengthen the local community. But every time we send out people, they come back home completely in love with the fruit farms and what they're doing. It's the same stories every time. And that is why I can invite media and journalists from, from Denmark. We've, uh, we've got a Mitos Pass and Julian's Pass, Julian's Pass, which is one of the, the biggest and most serious newspapers, I would say, in Denmark. And uh, they've come with us in order to tell these stories. If there was any way that I could um, filter what they wanted to say, there's no way that a journalist from Venus person would come with us. All I do is I, I pay for your plane ticket. I come and I make a program for you. You go out and you work in the fields and you meet the people. And then I know for sure that the story has written itself already. I'm not in any doubt that no that everybody will come home and be absolutely in, in love with these projects. And that's a, that's a really big thing for us, to try and see if we can get more and more media attention on this and uh, invite them on our trips. Sweden has been really hard to crack. Media in Sweden, very they're very afraid of the, the commercial aspect, that we're a commercial business. And uh, and so we, uh, we we're trying to tackle the... The story in Sweden a little bit different, but Denmark, Norway, and Finland has been really easy to get uh, the media's attention on this. So, Malawi mangoes and this picture. I'm using this to signify that we are partners in business, but also in philosophy. They started about three years ago. They had nothing. Those two businessmen been at Wall Street for many years, economics and suits, and here you go, everything is very fast. And uh, they met in Lilongwe for some business reason, some investment they were going to do, blah, blah, blah. And both of them were like <laughs> falling in love with Malawi and saying, hey, let's do something else. So tired of, uh, of stocks and numbers and not doing anything good in the world. Let's, uh, let's see if we can actually build something in this very, very undeveloped country. Anyone been to Malawi? It's not really a tourist destination. Um, it's a very safe country, beautiful, small, has a big lake, uh, extremely poor. Mostly it's just undeveloped. Some of you must have been to Africa, right? Yes. Where have you been? No, not me. Oh, oh okay. I've been you. to South Africa, Namibia. South Africa. And Namibia, yeah? And we go to Rwanda. You go to Rwanda? In three weeks. Nice. What are you going to do there? Uh, our for thesis. For your thesis? Bachelor thesis. What do you, what, what do you write about? Ecosystem services. Okay. Then you have a, um, some kind of business that you're going to visit and, and follow the their university. The local university there. The so local we're going to do it in okay. a national, a non-national park. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. It's a rainforest, so a mountain rainforest. Interesting. Cool. And you? What? Yeah. You said you've been to Africa too, no? You didn't? Yes, yes, you. South Africa and South Africa. South Africa, perfect. The thing is that when you fly into an African capital, and I'm not saying South Africa is a part of, of the rest of Africa now, but everywhere else in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, then you get pretty impressed. Okay, you know, you're thinking you are going to Africa, it's going to be to be dirt and, and poor people everywhere, but that's not how it is. You know, there are big buildings, there are lots of businesses, people in suits and things are moving. When you go to Lilongwe, when you go to Plantar, which is the official capital, and Lilongwe, which is the historical 
capital of Malawi. You just feel like you landed in the middle of the moon. There's nothing there. There are some small huts over there and some huts there, and then there's a gravel road there, and that's it. There's no sense of actual development of a of a big city vibe. It's just not there. This is how most African cities 50 years ago was, but not here. It's extremely undeveloped. And uh, so the fact that these two British guys, they decided we should build something here where there's absolutely nothing, and we should create something that Malawi is good at exporting. That whole idea was something that we found was very, very appealing. Very, very, uh, very nice idea. So three years ago, we started to visit them when they made their first little, they had a piece of land the same size as, as this classroom. And they hired two workers to actually work on it. Now, they hired 7,000 people. And they have, I'm not very good in hectares, but they have a lot of space. And they have a lot of bananas. And they just made the biggest processing facility that I've ever seen. And I've been to a lot of fruit farms. But they <coughs> think it might be the same size as this building. A processing facility is where you wash and peel and, and crush and store. And then heat up to 80 degrees, you're your banana purees. And that's what's the most important thing for, for fruit farms in developing countries. It's actually to have a processing facility so you can export your food. Because all the food that uh, is uh, not of best quality goes to the local market and that's fine. But that's not where the money are. It's very little that you can get from the side of the market to, to sell to your neighbor. But uh, if you can actually get a process up and running and get it to ship off to Europe, that's that's real bucks. So we have a specific relationship with Milano Mingos. We followed them the last three years. We've been there a little nine, nine or oh, ten or eleven times, many times by now. And we can see the progress every single time we go there. I usually say that if we use the same business model as they did here in Europe, and we can do the same kind of progress, then we would be billionaires by now. They've done so very well. Very very impressed by it. But, like I said, Malawi is a very, very poor country. And what have we done to change that? We poured in a lot of aid money. And this is a little screen dump I took from a report I, uh, I tried to find. It's called aidinfo.org. You can go and Google it. But anyway, you see, I won't go through all the numbers here. But what is important is that you see the aid inflows reported by the Malawi government. And then you see the aid report is by the donors. And can you see the difference to the numbers? There's a hell of a lot of zero here. And definitely, we all know that some of the money are lost in transaction, are lost in administration. You know, you have to use it to, to hire the people who are actually doing, who are organizing all these things. But zero, that's not okay. And it's something that the media has not focused on that I find very, very um, surprising. You can Google this and you can get it. You can see how the Malawian government are saying, we didn't get any money, we didn't. So I put this picture here. This is Mrs. Banda. She is, and respect for that, definitely, she is on a the first African presence, female, and uh, definitely, thumbs up for that, we should uh, definitely support uh, feminism in Africa, I'm saying that to Swedes, so, yeah, definitely, no, nothing against that, that's only a good thing, no, and what I do have something against is the other picture there, unfortunately it's not my feet, you know, it would be nice, but it's supposed to signify my feet, because uh, it was, uh, this one story I like to tell about how I, a while ago, it's been a long time now, six months ago, I, think, I was in Malawi, and I've been working with some journalists out in the field all day, and I was really tired, and I was sunburned, and I came down to our little guest house. We always we, we usually stay at some very basic guest houses, but still nice and comfortable and so on. So uh, we stayed at this place by Lake Malawi. It's the biggest inland lake in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and it's beautiful, and it's surrounded by amazing mountains. It's Zambia and Tanzania, and very peaceful, and it 
if you can imagine a few resorts and hotels and maybe uh, some cruise ships, then it could be the French Riviera. It's beautiful. Uh, only there's nothing here. And while I was uh, sitting with my feet in the sand and enjoying uh, local beer, I think, um, my boss, Brendan, who couldn't be here today, he texted me and he said, did anyone in Malawi tell you about the, the recent developments at uh, Mrs. Banda's uh, budget? Um, no, I haven't heard anything. Well, she had just chosen to spend her 2014, the rest of her budget, on seven big military ships to be put on Lake Malawi. And there's no way that I can tell you how absurd that is to sit in one of the most, like the poorest countries in the world, very safe, no threats, because there's nothing to steal there. And then imagine, then in just a few months, there's going to be big seven big ships on that lake. And then just to start thinking about what else those money could be spent for. That is. It's absurd, it's wrong, and it makes me sick. I read some interviews later based upon this because a couple of reporters were a little bit uh, skeptical about this, just as me. Like, Mrs. Banda, why are you doing this? Why are you choosing to spend all that money on seven big military ships? Well, you know, haven't you heard about the threat from Somalia coming in through Tanzania? <coughs> but not to Malawi. <laughs> what are they going to do here? Where are they going to be? What, what, what is that? The only thing, the only reason why she would do that is to show her muscles and to show the surrounding African governments that don't bullshit me because they, I have what it takes. Not really relevant. She should spend her, her money on building infrastructure and building the country instead. So, Good intentions, I've talked about a couple of times, but uh, are they good enough? This is a picture. I googled tomatoes African market, and then you see you get a bunch of uh, pictures of African tomatoes, because this is what many local Saturday markets look like. They look like uh, they have one crop, for instance tomato, and then it's just little farmer by farmer that sits on one long slide and selling the same things. People who don't even study economics can very easily predict that that's not very sustainable. If you go to the market every day and you try and sell the same thing as the person next to you, prices are going to, to decrease and in the end you're going to end up giving it to your kettle. This is a problem that unfortunately has been enforced and reinforced by the NGOs and the aid community in Africa. Good intentions, small NGOs, in, for instance, Denmark and Sweden, go out to, for instance, Malawi and say, we should do something good. We should give out a tomato plant to all the poor, poor people here. And then after one year, they can go and they can sell it. Let's do that. So 10,000 tomato plants are being shipped to Malawi and then giving out to all the farmers because that's a good thing, right? Then he can grow it, then he can sell it. Well, not if you give the same tomato plants to everybody else, then they're all gonna go to the market and try and sell it at the same time. It's not, it's not difficult to see how you're just shooting yourself in the foot there and making everything worse, unfortunately. Particularly in Malawi, the aid industry has actually not just been mm, not helpful to, to the private businesses and to Malawi mangoes, it's actually been hurtful. They are working against them. Um, so, I'm sure it's good intentions. It's just not good enough. It's not okay anymore. We're in 2015. You need to know where your money are going when you uh, when you donate them. Another little war we have because we have a couple in proof. And the last little thing is that we're saying we shouldn't just blindfold give out aid. We should know where things are going to. We should be critical about it. Another thing is that we're saying is that we should focus on trading with developing countries. Let let the conditions be as easy and possible as possible for them to actually sell their things to us. And are we doing that? And then we looked into the whole tariff and quota trade barrier schemes. And what we found is this picture. What do you think it is? I pretty much said it. Barriers to trade? Yeah, exactly. 
We're building a big wall up, looking something like this. And uh, does anyone study political science? No, but economics at least. And uh, this picture was taken by my old political science book 15 years ago when I was studying political science. And uh, the thing is that it was a big thing back then in the, 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 the late 90s and the, the early, what do you call it, early zeros, 2000. It was a big thing, trade barriers. All the media was talking about it, how we're in Europe, we're just protectionist, we're, we're bu building a big fort around ourselves and uh, no one can get in. But now, not so hot anymore. It's not really interesting, so let's not talk about it. The thing is that this is just as relevant today as it was 15 years ago. Some things are direct trade barriers, which is tariffs, quotas, and you can actually find them online. You can find out how much a mango from Malawi has to be has to go through the whole tax system before they can ship it off to us. Another thing is all the indirect trade barriers. Many, many years of preferential agreements with some countries makes it uh, harder for other countries to ever enter the trade uh, agenda and the trade fair. Rules of origin, which make sure that if a fisherman from Lake Malawi, if he wants to sell this fish in Mozambique because he's closer to the shore in Mozambique and because it's getting dark in a little bit, so it's actually too dangerous for him to be on the lake, then he can't, then he's going to be taxed an extra rule because he has to sell it in the country where he originated. Doesn't make any any sense. But we still have all these trade barriers, indirect and indirect, imposed on developing countries. So, I don't know what time. <coughs> okay, I'm way over. So, it's a rather big fight here. We're a small company, like I said, 40 something people, but we're growing a lot now. Um, and uh, this could seem maybe as uh, my own personal and my, my boss personal interest in Africa and international development and then we're trying to you know to use the brand as a, as a platform for that but the thing is that this is something the most important thing for us in Prouge is that everybody at Prouge are on board on this and we're not dictating anything we're not dictating any political opinions but we are saying you need to go on a fruit farm and experience yourself and then you can make up your mind. And I promise that everybody who are coming back are just completely revived and want to tell the stories of all the amazing things that the, the farms are doing. I worked at bigger companies. I worked at banks, for instance, even some that are in Sweden, and I won't say more, uh, at the CSR departments. And CSR sustainability, but a particular CSR has unfortunately lost a lot of, it, lot of its value, I think, the last 10 years. Uh, it's good intentions, we want to do something good, but unfortunately many companies have used it, misused the notion just to do something good so that the media can uh, tick that box saying, okay, they are doing something good. As I mentioned, I've worked at bigger companies with way, way more resources than Cruz do. We're a very small entrepreneurial company. But what we did there was just to scratch a little surface and then do a big communication blast out saying, this is what we did. And then the media are like, okay, then it works. And unfortunately, I think that's the reason why CSR has lost some of its, um, of its value to many people now. It has to be trustworthy. And so I think it's very important that if, when you found the place that you're going to work at, your company, that you, if you are going to be involved with CSR in any kind of way, that, that you're sure that, first of all, that the product that you're working with, it has to be relevant to that. You can't just say, okay, so we're working with smoothies, but um, let's have a fight for cows in Uganda. It doesn't make any sense. Or to have handicap uh, extra lined out because that's a, that's a good cause. You know what I mean? It has to be relevant to the product because everybody can look through that. Everybody can see that 
this is not right. It has to be re relevant to the actual product. And then it's very, very important that you and your bosses realize that it has to start from the, from the top. Most uh, CSR departments, unfortunately, is a little department in the communication department that's under marketing. Then two people are sitting and measuring CO2 emissions or something like that. Then they're making a quarterly report and that's it. Then we did what we had to do. But this has to come from the top. The management has to realize that if we are going to do this, we have to do it right. Or we have to do something uh, something real. And I think that's what's kind of, at least it's creating that sense of feeling that we have in Fruits is that actually we are doing something good. It's because it did start from the, from the top. There's not a, a limitation to what we can do here. Um, resource wise, I would say we spend maybe 70% right now of our marketing budget on this, on sending people to fruit farms to work with a shovel and then come back and tell their stories. I'm sure a lot of the, if you are studying marketing, you can think of other ways of how to market a little healthy product, trendy and urban and cool and whatnot that we are. But we are choosing this because we, we believe in it. And we know that at some point it will, it will make sense for us to, to do so. That's it, my last slide. The only yeah. way to make poverty is <laughs> I think that's it. And then uh, the questions. Yeah, <coughs> Sweden, I'm just have to. Yeah. Well, we right now we have for a couple of universities, Gothenburg, Lund, and a few other Swedish universities, we're making a competition saying that you can come on a trip if you go under our Facebook page. I'm sorry, this is the marketing department that's doing this, but uh, the thing is that we have a trip, uh, and the trip is located for Ecuador, northeastern side of the country, and it's in the it's in April, so we're, we're kind of in a hurry now, but there's a deadline for the for the applications on March 13th. And as, uh, as I told you about, you've gotten a lot of information about the program now, so you know what, it, what it's all about. But actually the whole week is that you, you, you fly out, we pay for everything, all your costs, all your vaccinations, all your living costs, you go and you live uh, rather basic, but uh, safe, and uh, Ecuador is beautiful. And then you uh, wake up early, you go and you work in the fields, you learn, you learn, learn. And then in the afternoons, we try and make as packed a program as possible for you to, to visit the local community. And then after five days, you're being flown back home. So it's one very, very intense and dirty and interesting and funny week, I would say. But there's a conversation right now. Yeah, and uh, it's, go it's going to be a, a student trip. So, so we have three students, I guess, who are winning. And then we'll bring just two universities. Sorry, it's just two. I'm sorry, but we have so many of these. So it's just two students, but then we also have some uh, Prush uh, reps, of course, who are you know in charge of the budget and has the communication with me and so on. So we have that right now. I have a question. Hmm? Um, what uh, challenges do you see for Prush in the future? Like, challenges? Yeah, to continue well, doing to make it better. Or well, uh, lots, I would say. Uh, for Fruch as a business, just the fact that we are we just launched in Japan, but we actually have most of our production in Africa, then they've been shipped off up to the Netherlands, to Rotterdam, and then up to us, and now we have to go all the way to Japan. Right now, we're trying to see if we can get a production facility in Southeast Asia somewhere, so that we can skip all those, those steps, of course. Because that's, uh, I'm sure, one of... Some of you will ask in a little bit about CO2 emissions and shipment and so on. And that's one way to, to reduce it, is that we get our own production facility out there. It's a big setup. Right now, we are, or they are, five people in the supply chain group. Three months ago, there were two. And they have to set all this up. So that's a big challenge. And then another thing is just in general, we have such a big um, demand 
particularly in, uh, in Norway and in Finland, was Finland and, uh, and in the Baltics and in the next couple of export markets that we can't keep up production. So that's a, it's a good problem, but it's, a, it's actually a problem. It's getting very, very popular. In Sweden, it's different. We're the market leaders and we're selling very good, but people just don't drink so many smoothies. Mm -hmm. So it's not that big of, a, of an issue. Another thing for the fruit farm program, I would say, it's um, we'd like to visit them all. I get so many requests constantly from uh, farms that would like us to come visit. And uh, in the beginning, it was actually me trying to hunt down the farm saying, please, can we come? And they were a little bit skeptical because what is that? Are you going to come and, and, and check us out and see if we're doing all these things wrong? Or, but now they know that we're actually coming to tell their stories. So, so I would say that's a challenge to find enough resources to actually do it. Last year, I sent out six delegations of people. And this year, it's going to be 12. So you can see how it doubles constantly. And uh, in the marketing, we're just three people. We have uh, Frida from Sweden, who's marketing manager of all the traditional marketing, that is health promotion and so on. And uh, then we have me, who's doing the fruit farm program and then one assistant. So resources and production, definitely, are the biggest challenges. But, uh, but, uh, but we're following the same path as, we, as, we, as we're on right now. And in terms of communication of uh, trade not aid and the fruit farm program, then it's always interesting when entering a new market like, for instance, Japan. You know, it's a different way of thinking over there. It really is. So uh, how is that message going to work over there? And is it something that they're going to take on board? We don't know yet. I'll go in a few weeks and uh, then we'll see what, what, where it takes us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the summer is coming up, just people graduating and you are growing. Are you looking for other Always, people? always, particularly in Sweden. Like, like are, if you're, you say you only three people in the marketing department. Oh, that's central. Sweden, they are. So are you looking for market chairs? Are you looking we for. We are. Other? Yeah, we are. We're Community always looking. <laughs> always looking for salespeople, of course. Uh, Sweden is growing a lot for you guys. I guess it would be more relevant to talk about student brand manager positions um, that we are working more and more with particular in Sweden. So the student brand manager is working closer to the man to the marketing team at Stockholm and trying to promote activities just like uh, like this. If you want you know? to find jobs working for Cruise. If you want to find jobs then go on to uh, our page. Go on to fruish.com or fruish.se and then uh, there's a recruitment um, email that you can you can reply to. It's always good to send your resumes to the Swedish department and they have it and then whenever we get a lot, but you know. So the demand is high. Excuse me? The demand for your work is it's, good. Yes, definitely. Definitely it is. We've grown constantly. But are you having internships as well or is it just these? Intern well, actually, it's a Danish thing. In Sweden they don't really do it and they say that it's not very common. So we haven't really started doing internships in Sweden, but why not? You I mean you can you can always head offices in Copenhagen. Head offices in Copenhagen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's a, it's, it's always a, always an option if you can do something uniquely out of yourself and say that you listen to this talk, blah blah blah, then they go for it. Yeah. Uh, who owns the farm? For instance, in, for instance, in Malawi. In Malawi, it's uh, well, it's uh, the two managing directors. They have about twenty percent of it. And then it's uh, backed up by uh, by financial uh, uh, operations back in uh, back in in England. But the setup is that you have x amount of people working on the farm. But then what you have you have seven thousand small holders. Do you know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a family. So it's a family owned farm. And then you're gonna teach them how to grow, for instance, mango that are very valuable in price. And then after one year. You're gonna come back and then you're gonna buy the the mangoes for a fixed price. That way, the guy, the little families, they can actually predict their income instead of just selling it to the Saturday market. Where you buy the farm, with the farm, and then you give a share to them. Or no, that's not how. No, uh, the we don't buy any farms first of all, but the fruit farmers, the the management team, they buy a piece of land, then they get backed up by some private capital, and then they say to all the small family farms. There are a bunch of, pretty much everybody in Africa, if you don't have any other kind of job, then you have a little piece of land where you grow something. Then they're going to tell them, they say, okay, if you're going to grow this crop, 
for one year. I'm, I'm going to teach you how to do it. Then after that one year, I will buy all your crops, all your products for a fixed price. Yeah? So, so the families own their own piece of land. They own their own crops, but they just know that they have someone to buy it for sure because they have a contract with that, that someone will actually take it. It's not going to be left off for the, for the kettles. So it's, it's a matter of, a, of keeping ownership uh, at the family's own hands, definitely, but making it more sustainable for them, making it possible for, to actually sell in their things. What about is that? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, no, what about the profits? Like, do you have any profit goals, or who owns Frush? Like, Frush is, is all the, the business reinvested, or is it on stock market? We're, no, well, we maybe at some point. No, not, not, not right now. Uh, We're just being sold right now, actually. And uh, to whom I cannot say right now, but uh, we are. It's a it's a private equity fund that's going to back it up around eighty percent. Then the management team. Then uh, we have a. Part of it as well, and uh, and uh, some private investors. But we are completely independent in terms of decision making. We have board meetings, and that means that the the board uh, can listen and ask questions uh, every three months. But we make our own. They must be interested in having a profit the crew as well. No. Are they interested in having a profit? Of course. Yeah. Of so course. But I wonder how much of the profit you're making are we invested in the farms? Emerging countries, developing countries. Yeah, well, it's, 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 it's not working that way. Okay. It's not. It's working that way is that, for instance, with Malawi mangoes, because we have a relationship with them, because we love their stories, then we've made a contract saying that as long as the price and the quality is right, because it has to be, otherwise we can't do premium products. As long as those two things are right, then we will always buy all our bananas from Malawi mangoes. If they can supply it. If they can't supply it because we're too big, then we got, have to get from other farms as well. But that's how we can do it. And for them to actually show other investors, if they need more fundraising, they can say, hey, but we have proof for saying that they are committed to buying as long as we can deliver. That's a big, big thing for them. That's a security that, uh, that you can't really, uh, uh, the money really can't buy, I would say. Mm -hmm. Where do you bottle the fruits up? Bottle? Yeah. That is in Sweden and in Germany. We have two different. Uh, okay, so you ship all the fruits there, and then it's going. We to we, we ship it in. Uh, we ship it uh, pasteurized, crushed, oh, right, okay. oh. and uh, and then it's being bottled up. It would be amazing to bottle it in, for instance, Malawi, but there's no no bottling facilities yeah. whatsoever. It would be great at some point if we could do that. As much as the infrastructure, as much as the as the process at the country at site is is best, but as of right now, there is no bottling. Companies, Coca-Cola has some, but it's their own. There's nothing you can do to uh, to get them. They own their own bottling factories. We're 42 people. We can't own a 40 uh, big bottling plant in Malawi. I wish, but uh, maybe it's a project at some point. Yeah. I was thinking if you have to do like how the workers are treated on the farms, because I'm I'm sure you make sure that the farms are getting well paid. Yeah, well, for instance, I, I just came back from Guatemala, and what they're doing there is that they have an association of independent banana workers, and that's almost working like a union, and that means that it's not a, like a checking exercise, but it's going out to help, to make sure that things are uh, on, on right track, and to, uh, and to promote good values, to uh, educate about HIV prevention, to... to Try and make a, a sustained business model as as possible. So I would say by organizations is usually how it works. That you you organize just like we did in Sweden and Denmark 100 years ago, but it's, it's starting to happen now, which is a which is a really good thing. But you know another thing is that I've been to so many farms now, and I haven't once ever seen anything that I'm not totally uh, in favor of. If you want to attract the best workers, and you do, all businesses in Sweden and in Ethiopia want to attract the best workers, then you want to deliver and uh, offer the best services for your workers. You want them to have it very, very nice. You want to build schools so that their kids can go to school. You want to build health connects so that if something happens and your machete is going to cut your arm in the field, you can go straight to the hospital because there's no social safety net there. There's no public hospitals in the, in the middle of Ethiopia, for instance. 
So you have to build that by yourself, and that's what the the farms are doing. the The farm I just visited, Guatemala, they've done an amazing job in building schools, and making programs for the kids, so that if the kids are supposed to be farmers, and if that's not what they would like, then they have specific tuition programs to send them off to Guatemala City to go into the university. And I think that's a really uh, actually generous thing to do. So one thing is that the business is actually uh, providing with the uh, health clinics and schools, but they're also saying it might not be that your biggest dream is to be a farmer. Well, then we can support you by taking you to this to this school. I think what I saw in Guatemala is kind of what, for instance, Malawi, they want to be when they grow up in 10 years' time. They're just not there yet, but they're they're working on it. It's, uh, it's really impressive. I think uh, time's up. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, if you're interested in uh, what we do in our social unions, um, Hundred Students for Sustainability or Hundred Female Network, you can just go on our Facebook pages or visit our websites. And um, yeah, thank you so much for coming, and thank you all for listening. <laughs>